Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for that kind, uh, kind applause. Uh, my name is David Tu. I'm a vice president at Jobs for the Future, and I'm thrilled for this federal policy session. We have some great public servants here who are going to uh, talk to us a little bit today about their perspective on what's going on in D.C. and throughout the country. So we're first going to do a quick little round of introductions. And so if they could each each of you guys just say your name, title, maybe where you sit in the organization, because I think it's maybe federal agencies are a little bit opaque to people on the outside. Um, and because we're going to be talking about career navigation and exploration and education, if you could just tell uh, tell the audience someone who's who's uh, influenced your journey and how they helped you explore. So, Roberto, we can start with you. Great, David, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here at South By EDU. Uh, my name is Roberto Rodriguez. Uh, I am Assistant Secretary for Policy and Planning at the U.S. Department of Education. So um, I oversee our policy development and policy priorities across the department from early childhood all the way through adult learning. Uh, I also uh, oversee our budget development process uh, our Office of Educational Technology, uh, and several other functions important to policy and planning. Um, boy, it's such a hard question to focus on one individual who shaped your trajectory in your career. I have so many amazing teachers that um, continue to be an inspiration and help steer me, give me confidence, uh, help me explore new ideas I would have never thought I, to explore. But the single figure I'll focus on really is my grandmother. So my grandmother, Dolores Jackal Sanchez, was um, in her 80s when she earned her GED uh, in my hometown in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, she was an immigrant from Venezuela. Uh, and uh, that really, that moment of standing up with her with that certificate really inspired me. Um, education's always been a North Star in my family, and uh, you know, it really started with um, uh, my grandparents uh, and um, their encouragement to continue to um, excel and reach your dreams through education. Thanks. Thank you so much, David, and good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here at South by Southwest EDU. My name is Lauren Starks, and I serve as the lead for the Good Jobs Challenge Program at the U.S. Department of Commerce, which is within the Economic Development Administration. Uh, my role has been a part of that team since October of 2021 to help uh, implement the American Rescue Plan programs, and it's been an exciting time to see how we work with our agency partners at Ed and Labor to drive that work. Uh, when I think about a figure in my life who has been influential, I, I have to go back to my, my hometown roots. So uh, I grew up in Southwest Atlanta, Georgia, and I was raised by my mom, who was the first person in our family to go to college. My mom taught at a Title I school and helped put a network around some of the most vulnerable students in the school system. And I saw how much that meant in terms of helping them navigate, helping them see different paths of potential in their own lives. Uh, and I was fortunate to have that support as well. I uh, am a former Pell student. Uh, I was the first person in my family to go to law school. And many people, my mom, counselors, teachers along the way, have helped me see the potential along my journey. Uh, and when I think about what's drawn me into service, what's brought me uh, really back into service in the Biden administration from uh, having served alongside Roberto and David and uh, so many others during the Obama administration uh, is this question of how do we help more individuals reach their full potential. Uh, and I've been drawn to spaces that uh, not only push me to think alongside so many others as to how we do that today, but also how we do it in a long-term way and how we do it at scale through federal investments in particular. Use this mic. All right. Um, thanks. Thank you for being here. And I'll echo. It's great to be here in Austin with all of you. My name is Brent Parton. I'm the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Employment and Training Administration at the U.S. Department of Labor. In that role, I, the Employment and Training Administration, otherwise known as ETA, over, is a sub-agency. It's the largest sub-agency of the U.S. Department of Labor. We oversee a number of the state, the, the federal workforce programs. So if you've heard of 
the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, the public workforce system at the state and local level, we, we oversee and fund that to the tune of about you know, $3 billion a year that goes out in formula dollars. We oversee a range of discretionary workforce programs and direct service programs as well, not only for workforce training, but supportive services. Uh, in addition to that, we oversee this small thing you may have heard of called unemployment insurance, uh, which has been a subject of much discussion over the past couple of years coming out of the pandemic, in addition to a number of foreign labor certification programs. So it's a, it's a broad portfolio, but it's a portfolio that's focused on providing opportunities for American workers across the board, no matter, and really meeting them where they are. Um, to that point, I guess I can echo a similar theme here and say, you know, there's been a, I've been fortunate to have a number of mentors and folks in my life who have helped my career along the way. But my grandfather, uh, John Davis from Aberdeen, Washington, which is a small town between, uh, hey, we got one clap, all right. Kurt Cobain is from there too, apparently. Um, small fishing town on the, on the coast of Washington State. Um, not a lot of people went to college in that town. He obviously, after serving in World War II, went back, got, got his degree. But I, and, and, you know, that's an inspiration to itself. But I will say what, what I knew of my grandfather is he went back to school multiple times over the course of his career. He went in engineering. Uh, he went and got a teaching credential. It, for him, it was always about how do I kind of always continue to learn, to continue to engage, and to continue to find ways to work with folks. And, and I know watching him, how many people he mentored into very late into his life. And I think that into itself, particularly now when we look at a, an aging workforce, we look at a lot of new labor market entrants and a lot of disruptive change, that intergenerational mentorship that, that folks can provide at any age is something I've benefited greatly from. It's something that he did really up to the end of his life, and it's really, I think, a, a role model for where we can all go. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing all those stories. I was thinking about it, uh, uh, same question, and I was actually going to break my own rule <laughs> and talk about my dad, who didn't, uh, he obviously gave me a lot of career advice, but the one thing he would do all the time, he was a professor at Boston College, and he would be at the gas station or at a store or somewhere, somewhere, and he would meet the attendant there, and he would try to get them to go to Boston College in the evening school and come take classes because he knew about the transformative power of education. And so he would bring people in and he said, I'll meet you tomorrow morning at the, you know, the office. And so it's just that, that little tap that various people can give. So I think any of us in our life can go and, and have that impact on people. So uh, I wanted to zoom out to think about, you know, there's many places we could start, but I think this is really a historic and unique moment in our country uh, for so many reasons, but there's been a lot of legislating that's happened over the last couple of years. Um, and so we have uh, trillions of dollars that are out the door or coming out the door soon um, for the Chips and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, and the others. Um, so I wonder if you could each talk about a particular part of all of those programs that gets you energized or excited, or you're really interested to see the impact of, and anyone can sort of go first. Sure, I'll start. Because the Department of Labor did not receive any of those investments, so I tell you what I am so excited about on that front. Uh, and, and I say that jokingly, but I actually say that because that's, that's one of the, been one of the most exciting things. Um, and I'll just say, because of the agency that I lead, the Employment and Training Administration, historically was there to help get people back on their feet in a crisis. And we're often what we call kind of the firefighter. So when the pandemic happened, unemployment insurance, career services, training, responding, to challenges to help people get back in the labor market. What is so exciting about this moment is these are historic forward-looking investments. And one of the most challenging things we do in workforce education and training is always trying to get a sense of where's the ball going? What's the demand gonna be not just today, but for the next year, five, 10 years, decades? These investments, because of the way they've been structured, the long view that they take, this is really an opportunity for once to not just try to move dollars out the door and train people and hope they get jobs, but to really thoughtfully engage in strategic planning at the community level across public and private sector partners. So when I look at CHIPS, when I look at the RAISE grants, which are for transit agencies to electrify buses at the Department of Transportation, across the board you see provisions not just for flexibilities to use for workforce training, but to do workforce planning. 
And I think that into itself might sound boring and unsexy, but the idea that there is actual funding to pull together stakeholders around the table, to build equitable pathways, to make sure we're being thoughtful about how are certain jobs changing and how are certain careers being created, that's the massive opportunity and that's what really is the game changer about this type of demand side investment. And it's something we at the Department of Labor are really thrilled to be working with commerce, transportation, energy, and of course education across the board. Well, I want to double click on all of that and uh, just say, just echo that this is such an exciting time in part because I believe that this is a moment, this is an invitation to do things differently. I think that these investments writ large have uh, accelerated the focus on economic mobility, on equity, uh, on how we're aligning our resources, our communities, local leadership uh, in powerful ways that are going to move the needle. and. Uh, at Commerce in particular, we're executing on the $3 billion I mentioned under the American Rescue Plan, but we're also focusing in through CHIPS, the $52 billion, uh, through our broadband funding, the BEAD program, uh, and in many other ways. Um, you know, in particular, I lead the Good Jobs Challenge program, which is a $500 million initiative. It's the first ever program at Commerce to focus on job training. And in August, we made 32 awards out of 500 applications received across the country uh, to partnerships that are bringing community colleges, employers, state and local agencies, economic development organizations, and other critical stakeholders to the table to solve local challenges around workforce in 15 industries. Uh, these programs have many parts to them, but I, I want to lift up a couple of, of highlights uh, of what this model's about. Uh, first of all, these resources are going towards underserved areas and communities, particularly women, people of color. How do we help more folks that have been left behind get back into this economy? Uh, second of all, the projects have a focus on supportive services. So how do we remove barriers? How do we encourage and incentivize strong partnerships with community-based organizations? and nonprofits such that issues like childcare or transportation or coaching or counseling are not going to prevent someone uh, from getting to and through a training program uh, and sustaining and, and being uh, in a place that where they feel they can thrive uh, in, a, in a good job. Uh, there's also an, a strong focus on employer leadership, employer engagement. We have hundreds of employers coming together with each, with each of these projects and making commitments. And, you know, also boosting uh, uh, understanding of what industry-driven practices are going to be important to make sure these programs are put together in a high-quality way. So, you know, we could, we're going to talk, I, I'm going to look forward to talking more about the impact of this work, some examples of that, of that leadership, but just want to say, you know, how exciting it is to be able to work alongside ed and labor uh, and to release guidance like our job quality toolkit such that we understand the proof points that we're creating across this investment in, in a long-term way. It's fantastic. I also will just um, <clears throat> double click on um, the, the vision here uh, and, and the picture that you're getting from uh, Lauren and Brent's remarks and say that, you know, I I'm most excited about the moment we're in because these investments, you know, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, you know, and through CHIPS and through IRA, they are reshaping our economy, right? They are reshaping what our careers, uh, our workforce, they're, they're having big impacts on workforce demand. Um, you know, we're looking at how we can build new sectors of bioengineering and biomedicine and double down on uh, our sectors around infrastructure and, um, and do more to help support uh, advancing uh, some of the, these new technologies in IT, clean energy. Um, so the opportunity to engage young people and engage workers and adults in preparing for this economy of the future that is here today uh, is huge. And often as we see these economic demands shape um, the contours of opportunity, if you will, at the local level, at the federal level, we don't always have a lot of tools to bring to bear. This is different, right? We have a tremendous set of investments that President Biden has shepherded forward for us to help support. And we have the opportunity, actually, to engage 
uh, as agencies together in that effort. All three of our secretaries have had the chance to stand together and say, how can we get our K-12 system and our post-secondary system working more actively with our workforce development system, working more actively with employers. And those three legs of the stool, how can we enjoin them and, and create a stronger foundation? So the opportunity to collaborate uh, and bring those systems together so that the experience for our workers and for our young people is a more seamless pathway. Um, that is the other thing that gets me excited and, and, you know, really proud to be working with my colleagues toward that end. I'll just mention one other thing, which is not in any of those three investments, David, but the uh, omnibus bill that just passed last fall uh, for our agency, and our agency was not a recipient of any of those other earlier funds mentioned, but we are working, you know, alongside the uh, jobs challenge that um, Lauren mentioned. We're working alongside our partners at Labor, but we're also standing up deeper investments in career and technical education at the Department of Ed. And uh, Congress has made available the opportunity to shape a new career connected high schools challenge, which for us, $25 million this year will be putting forth to help support districts to again, tear down those barriers with post-secondary and with employers and design more work-based learning opportunities, design more opportunities for college and career readiness, uh, and design more opportunities for advising to engage our young people earlier and give them agency in how they prepare for their careers and for their future in the economy. That's great, thanks. Um, so that, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of activity <laughs> going on right now. What do you think is next? So the Biden administration has two years. I think you probably have a lot of things that you still want to get done. What are you most hopeful to see? And maybe relatedly, is there any more bipartisan action that might happen? Like, are there any other bills that you could prognosticate might happen? Oh boy. <laughs> Silence. Um, I've already gone first. <laughs> I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in. Uh, and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited about the chance for our agencies to continue to work together and provide guidance to the field and really do some bright spotting. I mean, this is where, you know, we have um, local communities and state systems, our community college systems, our workforce systems that have figured out how to come together, craft those types of memoranda of understanding, sit together around a table, and enjoying that economic and that education strategy more actively together. That is the thing that I think we have a big opportunity, you know, and with these investments as the wind at our sails, uh, to approach building skills and building workforce and, and, and training and education in new ways, right? In ways we haven't done classically. Um, so we can't let those silos in our system get in our way, and I think, you know, part of what we, the opportunity we have is a bright spot, some, some places to get that done. Um, you know, we are putting forth, the president's putting forth his budget for all of our agencies tomorrow. So that renews our conversations with Congress uh, on a statement of our values, a statement of our policy priorities, a statement of our vision for where we should go. I know all of our secretaries are excited about that. We will take that case and press that case uh, to Congress through our hearings over the coming weeks. Uh, and I think there is, you know, if there is any opportunity for bipartisanship, it's got to be in preparing and supporting our workforce for the future, right? This is not about a red state, blue state blueprint here. This is about how we support preparation for good jobs and for a strong economy. Every leader in every state wants that. They want a strong economy. I, and I would say, to, to kind of highlight that, the, the first two years of these investments, this has been a lot of deep work around aligning on what the language says and how to craft these funding opportunities. That takes time in the federal government, and it certainly takes time if you do it right. And, and, I, and so, for example, Department of Labor and Commerce developed a joint definition for job quality. So if the idea is that we're going to say we want these investments to support quality jobs, well, what does that mean? That took work, and, but it, took, it was work worth doing because it's embedded in those investments. The next two years, 
I would say, is about how we scaffold exactly what Roberto's saying, the types of partnerships. Like, we can talk and be friends at the federal government all we want. If the stakeholders across labor, education, transportation, economic development, energy aren't collaborating in public private sector at the state and local level, you're not going to see those things become real. So I think that's the work of the next two years, at least, is to really, I would say on three big areas, and, and for this audience, how do we have really strong labor market signals about what are the types of jobs that will be created across these investments? There's vectors of jobs that, whether you're reshoring semiconductors, doing electric vehicle manufacturing, or you know electrifying buses, that across all three investments, there's common occupations and jobs that will be impacted. How are we also enabling the types of partnerships on the ground, and in addition to kind of holding them up, seeing where we have resources like what EDS has on the career pathway side. We have some funds that we'll use from our H-1B pot in the coming weeks to put some kind of proof points on the ground about $80 million. So I think that's the implementation that's going to have to play out. And, and I will also add that I think when we're talking about implementation and uh, the need to focus on enablement, there's also a really important conversation around sustainability and how do we sustain the work. And I will say that we will learn so much over the coming years through the implementation uh, around where the challenges are, where the barriers are, and what flexibilities are additionally needed by some of these projects across the country to actually reach their full potential uh, in a long-term way. And so I do think, you know, when I was at Ed, I worked on areas of authority uh, that the department had for certain waivers, for certain innovative possibilities, uh, for certain pilots and demonstration projects. And I think there's been a lot of good bipartisan energy around uh, thinking about that potential and thinking about where do we have uh, the ability to, to carve out flexibility such that uh, this work can be done in, in more creative but also in more sustainable ways. I won't fully dodge your federal policy legislation question and say there are areas, I think Roberto's exactly right, workforce is bipartisan and, and it's not just about these bills, it's where we look at where it's going on in the care sector in terms of things like nursing, teaching. These are areas where Congress has put a lot of attention, we're working with members on that front. WIOA has been signaled to the new leadership on the Republican side as an area of interest that is certainly an interest for us. And I'll just kind of say that, you know, if we're going to really meet the moment, we need to make sure that the workforce system is, you know, revamped in a way to meet the moment. Yeah. Well, I think that people underestimated President Biden's ability to get things done at the beginning, and he's gotten a lot done. So I could imagine something happening in the next two years. That's maybe the optimistic vision. Um, I wonder if we could switch gears a little bit. We're sitting in a room of entrepreneurs and innovators and practitioners. What's the best way for them to engage with you all, with the agencies, to, to you know, give their learn, learned and lived experience to impact some of what's going on. What's the best way of interface? Well, you know, just to the, to the broader topic there, David, I'll just say that, you know, if the uh, pandemic has done anything, it, is, it has exposed the inequities in our systems uh, and in our communities that were present pre-pandemic and unfortunately, um, were exacerbated by the by some of those uh, effects. Whether that is thinking about food security to access to health care to thinking about access to educational opportunity, and as we often say, the playbook that we use to tackle some of those grand challenges pre-pandemic will only get us back to the solutions that we had pre-pandemic. We need a different playbook, right? We need to bring the scale. And certainly in the sector that I work in, in education, the type of innovations from how we engage our youngest learners all the way through how we connect with and support our educators in elementary, middle, and high schools, certainly to our post-secondary system and our workforce training, workforce readiness programs. We need to engage that innovation in a more active way, right? We need to make space for that. Um, we need to think about um, the systems that that we've built, and uh, and and how how innovation and entrepreneurs engage with those systems. Uh, we need to think about how to incentivize and support that. Right. So you know we're doing that in the context of some of the work right now in educational technology to think about well how do we uh, create some space and a bit of a blueprint and a roadmap for 
folks that are doing innovative work, whether that's helping to enable um, pivots in, in teaching and learning or real-time feedback loops for learners uh, as they're progressing in their education and their training systems or um, better tools for advising for our post-secondary learners in higher ed. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going to continue to look for those, you know, we have, we've probably hosted two, three dozen webinars and a whole host of handbooks on how to support um, uh, recovery and reinvestment post-pandemic. Uh, but we're always looking for opportunities to connect. That's, I think, why we're all here and excited to be here at South By, too. I also think there's a need for storytellers. So, you know, when we get on the other end of our five-year grant with these projects, there's going to be a lot of impact. All of these initiatives are uh, projecting to place 50,000 workers into good jobs. And the impact on the ground, it needs to be lifted up. We need to be able to tell the story. And so I do think uh, this is a creative space. There are many people out here who are thinking about ways to do that in, uh, in, in very innovative ways. And so kind of looking, looking out and, and thinking about ways that you can move along with some of this work and help tell the story of it that brings more folks in and helps uh, others connect to what they're doing and what they're seeing. I think that's, I think that's important. I also think um, spotlighting best practice, spotlighting evidence-driven research that can be embedded into communities of practice that are being created around these investments is really uh, an important way to engage and uh, can help us see new ideas. You know, we uh, are already hearing uh, critical questions from uh, from, from our program around things like sustainable financing models, you know, um, how to implement career impact bonds as like a way to move this funding beyond the, the, current, uh, the current grant period. Uh, issues around braided funding, you know, tactical strategies that can support that. Uh, you know, uh, child care, how to address issues in child care deserts such that, you know, supply can meet demand, like is, uh, innovative ideas one of our projects is looking at are, you know, how to accelerate entrepreneurship among home-based uh, child care providers or looking at uh, uh, internet platforms that allow referral services in rural areas or in areas uh, that, that are uh, implementing construction projects where the hours may not be typical for a daycare center or for uh, a, a child care provider uh, that's more traditional. So, you know, just lifting up those ideas to us and letting us uh, know can be a great way to supplement and uh, bring that into our TA and to the strategies that our uh, communities of practice are using. I think that's a great illustration of you know, where you all can help, which is, you know, we're, we're good at scaling things when we have the systems and the jurisdictions to do it. There's a lot of gaps. And I think, you know, exactly to this point around, we can fund some workforce training dollars, but that's not going to work if there's not access to care services for folks, particularly if you're trying to get women into these types of jobs, or frankly, you're trying to reach in and get folks that have been outside of the labor market for some time. I would say the same thing is true also for how we think about jurisdictions on, on, on like credentialing. And I can tell you right now, a lot of these investments that are happening, particularly in like advanced manufacturing, they're happening in labor markets that are going to pull across jurisdictional lines, whether that's a metro area or frankly a state. And that's an opportunity. And, and I say that for this audience to really be thoughtful about, you know, there, what we fund has limits. And based on the jurisdictions who funds it, where are there ways to support worker mobility and portability across traditional lines? Where are there opportunities as well for how we, how we even think about cross-cutting needs and mapping competencies that might be useful in a job today that might be impacted by new investment down the road, but how does that apply? I think that's work that the entrepreneurial space has really led in in some ways, and I think there's a huge opportunity to infuse that in a lot of what's going to be playing out over the coming years. Can I just jump in on that really good point too, David, and say, you know, I think what you'll see from all of our agencies and our administration at large is an embrace of those innovations and uh, desire to really help accelerate and support that work, right? So if you think about, you know, I think about the one of the big rocks we have to move in education is this teacher shortage that we have of 174,000 additional teachers we need to bring back into the system, right, since pre-pandemic. 
And so there we've, you know, been able to partner really effectively thanks to the leadership at the Department of Labor and Brent and his team have been amazing in saying, all right, well, let's think about a registered apprenticeship model for teaching that we can push out alongside the Department of Education and a pathway that now we've gone from two states to 16 states thinking about what type of learn and earn models can we introduce in the system, you know, to help address this challenge. Right, that's a different way of thinking about what has been a challenge, is a decades old challenge of how do we recruit and attract teachers into the profession. So we, and, and we want to continue to stand up, you know, as, as agencies and together in the administration and say, and invite others to, you know, help develop those types of solutions and as Brent says, like bring them to scale. And I would just say from, you know, my time in government, it was like, it's kind of an open door policy. Like, I think your emails are all like on the websites, like people, like you're looking to get advice and, and, and uh, like stories, as you're saying, Lauren. So I would just encourage everyone, like write to these folks, to others. I think it's great that you all are at an event like this. I think probably because of the pandemic, there were a lot of webinars, but hopefully there'll be more in-person convenings and whatnot where people can come and interact. I think people were often like, wow, like I only interact with the bureaucracy, but you all are real people. And it was like nice for people to get to like actually meet government bureaucrats. So glad that you're here for that. Uh, we care. Yeah. You'll notice us because we have ties at South Right, that's South how you West. can find them. <laughs> so on a sort of related note, so I'm on this task force with an organization called Convergence to try to get more young people into the federal government and into federal service. Um, I wonder if you've heard anything about efforts afoot in the government or like are there ways that we can get more young people gen z folks like into government service for a career or maybe for a, just a little while for now or how might we think about that there's one way make it easier to get a job in the federal government <laughs> <laughs> and and i we don't make it easy and and i will say one of the things that you know we're, we are taking a hard look at working with the Office of Personnel Management that I'm really excited about is what Roberto just mentioned around the teacher registered apprenticeships is we've been working closely and growing registered apprenticeships with the private sector across sectors in not just the, the trades, but in IT, cybersecurity, and healthcare, and financial services. We've been telling the employers in the private sector to step up for a long time, we have not been walking that walk. And so we are looking at a federal apprenticeship pathways program with OPM. It's still very much in the early stages, but it's this idea of looking at where do we have cross-cutting needs. You know, there's people that you all hire that we also hire with the same occupations, the same competencies. How can we create new alternative pathways, skills-based pathways, not based on whether or not you have a degree, to get into the federal government. So it, that, that will be one piece, but I do think the administration, I think overall, when it thinks about, for example, diversity, equity, inclusion, and the executive order that was one of the first acts of the administration, I think we have held up a mirror to ourselves. And, and that takes work, you know, it, it, it takes time, and I know that's, that's kind of a common refrain with the federal government side, but it, it, it is a commitment that it's not just about how do we, you know, not just do as we say, but we really need to do as we do. And so I'll, I'll, I'll yield to see what other my colleagues have to share, share, but it is something we're working on. Yeah, I, well, I'll just, you know, federal government and public service is tremendous. Like we need, it, it is a tremendous opportunity. You know, I'm a little biased. I've spent the better part of my career in public service. But it is a tremendous opportunity to serve and support your community. It is mission-driven work. Uh, and it's work that needs talent. Like, we need more talent uh, in the federal government. Uh, I couldn't agree more. We have to do a better job on our hiring processes and those pieces as well. But I think, that, you know, the other big piece here is we need a demand signal you know from Washington that says we need you right we want we want, we're gonna think about how we can create those pathways more intentionally but we need you to step up and surf um, you know there's great we have wonderful internships fellowships a lot of a lot of partnerships with other nonprofit organizations that um, support and source um, relevant talent and education to be able to come and serve even if it's for, if it's for a matter of months uh, at the Department of Education. 
but we need to do that better and we need to be more intentional on the diversity front because you know and i i will say like this administration you know more than any other that i've had the opportunity to work with or work within uh has centered such a commitment to equity uh and such a commitment to diversity uh in the workforce um and we each of our agencies has plans to walk that walk uh, and each of our agencies is held to account directly from the White House around um, supporting that work. All right. Um, well, I'm glad equity has come up a couple times. Uh, I wanted to turn to that topic. Um, for some of these big federal investments, they're sort of very broad in general. There are some programs that are a little bit more targeted at subpopulations or specific groups facing disadvantage. Um, I wonder if you could each talk about one of the programs that you find is really targeted. I think, I think Lauren, you had one around women and gender equity. Yes, well, I, it doesn't uh, escape me that today is International Day of Women and it's Women's History Month. Yes, and you know, I, I'm thinking about this through a, a particular industry lens. You know, we know that women make up half of the workforce, but fewer than one third of jobs in manufacturing. Are, are women, um, go to women. And so uh, we know these are good paying jobs that on average about women make about 16% more than the national medium annual income compared to women in other sectors. We've seen some encouraging signs. The Census Bureau recently released some data that the share of women in manufacturing has gone up across every age group and is approaching pre-pandemic levels. But to me, this feels like a big moment. It feels like we can accelerate and push on the levers of these investments to do even more and, and to do it faster. And so uh, among the ways that the Good Jobs Challenge program is doing this, we are funding uh, a statewide program, the Ohio Manufacturing Manufacturers Association is implementing. This is a $23 million project that is implementing uh, in partnership with a th over a thousand employers across the entire state of Ohio, uh, entry level earn and learn uh, models that are going to help so many workers, women in particular, get access to these good paying jobs. And what's exciting to me is that we know that one of the strategies to do this better is earlier encouragement through STEM. And so exciting to see and exciting to work with Ed on uh, ways to do this even better, the alignment of this project to K-12 strategies across the state. So working with the Ohio STEM Learning Network as well as Battelle Education, uh, K-16 collaboratives in the state to really ensure that there is that close alignment and earlier exposure to STEM uh, for uh, younger students. And so I think this is going to make a big difference. You know, we're also hearing firms uh, already with this project, they uh, have talked about how employers are uh, in conversation with women, with workers, and are changing their practices. So, you know, one of the things about this, and partnership is hard, right? Partnership is hard, and this work, uh, we do want to create proof points uh, and understand what it takes to actually create cultures of belonging. You know, we released the Good Jobs Principles with the Department of Labor last summer, and it talks about creating that culture, creating that uh, opportunity for advancement, and that starts with seeing people and meeting them where they are. And so uh, this project has emphasized that that's happening already and that they're seeing uh, so much that's getting incorporated, whether it's through hiring guides or other uh, tangible impacts. But it's, it's great to see, and I think it's going to make a big difference uh, just this week I guess I, and it echoes a lot of these themes but if you if you think about who's gonna build roads and bridges who's gonna build semiconductor fabs who's gonna you know build the next generation of electric vehicles it's going to be skilled trades and the, the administration's placed an emphasis on making sure that these investments create good union jobs when you look at the skilled trades and in their registered apprenticeship programs, it's still pretty rough in terms of women and people of color, that the percentages of registered apprentices, particularly women, and it is, it is International Women in the Construction Trades Week as well, and so it's why we made this announcement, but it, it's less than 10%. And these are, there's few sure bets in this country. One of those sure bets is if you can get in a good union apprenticeship, you have a skill and a career for life, and you will make well beyond family sustaining wages. 
So to not diversify those programs would be the most massive, not only missed opportunity, but injustice. So what we have launched on uh, Monday, we announced a new partnership, Secretary Walsh, the head of the North American Building Trades, uh, Mark Morial, the head of the National Urban League, the, Inter the International Trades Women Committee, a new 20 million apprenticeship readiness network across the country that's specifically geared towards filling these jobs created by these federal investments, focused on women and people of color getting into direct entry union apprenticeship programs. It's a network of sites across the country building off a model that works, heavy wraparound services like childcare, and most importantly, the support for ensuring that once someone's placed in an apprenticeship, there's work being done on the ground for the mentors to work with people that don't look like them. And when it's one thing to get people into these apprenticeships, get, get women or people of color into them, we want them to stay in them. And so doing that work takes resources and investments. So we're really excited about that kicking off. Both have me excited. It's great investments. Yeah, I, I want to build on um, a couple of the themes that were discussed here and just spotlight one program. Uh, and, and you know, I think we really at the Department of Education, uh, uh, as I know my colleagues do, just really take uh, the President's executive order um, so seriously and are looking at opportunities across our discretionary grant programs to advance um, racial uh, equity and and a support equity across uh, many of our programs but one program that really is designed to address the challenge that we have across the country in in attracting supporting and elevating uh, a diverse teaching workforce uh, is our Augustus Hawkins Centers of Excellence program so we have today fewer than 20% of our teachers that are teachers of color in our classrooms. And we have over 53% of our students across our public education system that are students of color. And for many students uh, in corners across the country, their access, they may go their entire academic career without access to one, to, to, or without seeing a teacher of color in their school. So, we know all of the research that shows the power of windows and mirrors, so to speak, right? And it's the same power that I think you see in, in the trades too. It's how can we have others that might look like us, might be able to, we may be able to identify with and say, this is a path that I can take. For many of our young people, it's how do, how do they, are they able to see those teachers at the, at the helm of their classroom? Do we give them windows into their future um, and into what they can grow into in terms of their potential. And we know all the research that shows just how important our teachers of color are for um, continuing to advance our values, our democratic values, our pluralistic values as a country. Um, so that diversity is something we know is good for all of our kids. And so what the Hawkins program has done in last, week, last uh, month, we announced $18 million in grants to our historically black colleges and universities, our Hispanic serving institutions, our tribal colleges and universities to begin to grow the pathways into the profession and help prepare a new generation of diverse and talented teachers. Great, yeah, those are some really powerful programs and examples. I think it underscores also the importance of having a diverse team in the federal government. And like I look at the pictures of the Obama administration and it's very diverse and it's really kudos to the administration for prioritizing that. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I'm also mindful that our time is running short. So I wanna um, open up now for questions from the audience. I think there is a mic over here and maybe we can start up front. Right over here. Yep. Hi there, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us. Um, I know you're not at all busy these days, so uh, appreciate it. Uh, I'm John Roberts, uh, I'm with Luminary Labs. Um, I'm a federal contractor, so I'm gonna really try to make this phrased in a way that won't get you in trouble for answering, but I, I think you're spot on with the excitement around both the appropriations, but also the policy tools that were authorized in the past couple of years. And at the same time, on paper, there are a lot of similarities and overlaps when you look, not even just across your departments, but with NSF TIPS Directorate, DOE, et cetera. So I'm curious how you all think about 
looking across the investments that are being made to avoid duplication or avoid kind of repetition of mistakes and particularly how you think about making sure one, one billion plus one billion equals more than two? I'll say first, just as again, an agency that doesn't have that money it puts us in a really unique position to work with our, our partners. And, and I'll put it this way, one of the approaches we're taking is, you know, this is the better problem to have, let's, let's first say that. But we're trying to train the trainer. The information that is out there on these investments, it is very easy for us to overestimate how much is seen on the ground. And there's a lot of confusion on the ground of what are, could be up to 40 plus new ways to fund education and workforce training across these three bills alone. So what we are trying to do in partnership with all of our federal family is use a very bureaucratic tool to do a very basic thing, which is we want to use guidance out to our workforce system and partners and say, here's what, just first off, here's what's coming, here's where that money lives, here's where the flexibilities are, but at the end of the day, it has to be partners at the state and local level that are the only ones that are gonna be able to look across these things in a way, because those resources are gonna come into their communities. I hate to put, take us off the hot seat. I'm more worried about duplication and replication at the state and local level that undervalues the potential joint impact of these funds. And I think that's the great risk we're trying to guard against is Let's not set up a new system, a new program, just for one funding stream in a local area that's knocking on the same doors of an employer as every other funding stream. Let's really be thoughtful. That's why I said earlier, it's the strategic planning, it's the workforce planning, it's connecting workforce, K-12, CTE, community colleges on the supply side to be able to respond to these things. So for us, we have to get the information out there. I think we have to do a lot of technical assistance and support. And most importantly, we have to do that together. So we're sitting, just getting this in the room to speak with some voice helps reduce that risk a little bit. I can attest to the confusion on the ground. <laughs> There's certainly people who don't know what's going on. I think that's a place for other folks in this room to step up also, like JFF can help provide some uh, information about the guidance. because. You have to write in federalese. You know, you can't be quite as clear as external organizations can be. So whether it's JFF or Luminary or I saw Ithaca SNR in the room, like there are other organizations that can do this. I think philanthropy has a role to support some of that. But uh, but that, that, that's a partnership I think between the government and, and other agencies. I just wanted to briefly add that from from where I sit, uh, I see that we are deduplicating and we're getting tighter alignment in terms of our agency coordination. Uh, in a couple of ways. The first is around guidance. So I think that jointly releasing guidance, jointly releasing toolkits, uh, these are kind of action forcing mechanisms to help us think through where our policies overlap and where there are opportunities to lift up each other's work. So we've done that. I noted the job quality toolkit uh, and the good jobs principles, but we also utilize mechanisms like memoranda of understanding, MOUs across our agencies uh, that further uh, create that architecture for coordination. I also think we do this in the TA space. So, you know, we I have through my program, been uh, very grateful to be in conversation with the D Department of Labor Women's Bureau, the Department's Good Jobs Initiative, uh, the Office of Career and Adult Technical Education, policy advisors uh, on the ed team, and we're talking about what we're seeing on the ground and where their expertise can help gap fill. We're doing that in real time. Uh, every day, every week. And so, you know, I think that's important because that then feeds into uh, playbooks, that feeds into uh, materials that we release to our grantees. And I think that uh, it, it just shows that there's this effective feedback loop uh, of, of strategies that work. Uh, and then, you know, the, the final place I think is uh, utilizing the convening power of the federal government. So, ed, labor, uh, shoulder to shoulder with Department of Commerce when, when we hosted the kickoff for for the first uh, Good Jobs Challenge convening in December, and we're part of designing that event and part of uh, how we set up an effective way to you know, support our grantees in being as successful as possible. Uh, maybe another person up front here. Uh, 
So you mentioned the investment in teacher pathways. I have to read because otherwise I'll ramble. Uh, for people of color, it's no secret that the teaching teaching profession is grossly underpaid. What efforts are being taken to ensure employment pathways working to draw in historically marginalized groups like women or people of color are promoting economic mobility within professions like teaching and not perpetuating cycles of poverty and ensuring that jobs are indeed, the pathways that are being created are indeed to high earning jobs? Yeah, it's such a great uh, question. Thank you for it. You know, um, we have to acknowledge as a country that we must do much, much better with respect to uh, supporting and elevating our teachers. And that begins with this foundation of compensation, right? When we have so many teachers in many of our states having to balance two jobs, three jobs to be able to put food on their table for their family, um, it just brings into clearer focus how much further we have yet to go. Uh, with respect to um, supporting a more competitive salary. You know, we know that our teachers uh, often um, uh, suffer from a wage penalty of upwards of 24 cents on every dollar earned from other college graduates uh, in the teaching profession, serving in the teaching profession. So, you know, we're marshalling uh, our efforts to make sure that that more states are aware of this challenge. And one thing that uh, Secretary Cardona has done is to really advance new guidance and new calls to action with dollars from our uh, American Rescue Plan, uh, which has put forth an unprecedented amount of funding across all of our states to say, here are some very uh, uh, active ways that you can utilize ARP dollars to support teacher compensation, teacher salaries, teacher retention bonuses. And we're seeing great uptake um, across the country, you know, from Indiana to Maine to other places that are really looking to put those dollars into action. Um, you know, the other thing that it will, I'll say is that we have to do more on the front end to make sure that the pathway to into teaching is more accessible and affordable. And this is why I'm so excited about this learn and earn model because it eliminates so much of those, of that front end down payment that many candidates have to make to be able to just um, consider entering and being a candidate and entering into a pathway for the profession. We, of course, have our TEACH grants. We have other scholarship programs that need further attention and further investment. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to make that pathway into the profession much more affordable, uh, especially if we're going to surge with talented and diverse teachers across our country, and we need to make sure that they that that earning potential is on par with other graduates. All right, I think we'll try to sneak in a couple more questions uh, over here. I wrote mine down too to try to keep it tight. Um, there appears to be a bipartisan recognition that we need a public-private approach for uh, financing and investing in talent, training, and education that is more fit for our time than the past. So how can we bridge the gap between the institutions like mine, Ascent, uh, and the uh, programs that you mentioned here at your various agencies uh, that are focused on um, financial well-being, and economic mobility um, and the people who struggle most to access those programs. You're gonna hear a common theme, but the, in my view, the, the ultimate public-private partnership is apprenticeship programs. And the reason that this administration's doubled down on that, and again, it has a long storied tradition of public-private partnership. There hasn't been a cent until 2015 that went into the expansion of registered apprenticeship programs. It was fully funded by strong public-private resources. Come flash forward to 2016, 2017, Congress started appropriating dollars. The Obama administration made a first payment to expand programs to new sectors, to try to get some startup going in the kind of infrastructure that's needed to sustain those partnerships. Why apprenticeship works? You would only have a successful public-private investment if everybody wins. Apprenticeship programs are structured to have a return on investment for the employer, while at the same time delivering for the apprentice. It's one of the few workforce programs that's been evaluated to death 
and continually shows that regardless of what industry sector it's in. Business will pay for what it values. So if you can create partnerships, and I think then the question is, well, where are they if they work so great? I think it is reducing the transaction costs for employers that don't know about apprenticeship, don't know how to start setting it up, and that's where the investments in media organizations, JFF has been a national partner with us on this effort to work with some, some intermediaries or for-profit organizations that charge employers and manage the apprenticeship programs for them. Some are community colleges across the country or community-based organizations. But the recipe of that contract between the employer and the apprentice, having a mutual benefit is what's key, in my view, for how you scale and sustain things, in, particularly in a workforce space. Great. Any other questions? I see some hands over this way. It's a little, the lights are kind of bright up here. Hello, um, I am from Washington State. I serve on a school board there. Uh, we know that 65% of our students sitting in our classrooms today are being educated for jobs that don't yet exist, to use tools that haven't been invented in a world we can't possibly imagine. How do we do that? Well, I think one thing we do is to provide uh, our young people um, greater agency in their learning and in their development and in those pathways. Um, you know, we often, we have a norm in our high schools where uh, we don't often ask and engage our young people in what their future looks like, whether that is career, post-secondary educational attainment, community college, four-year degree, industry-recognized credential. We don't start that conversation until senior year for some of our kids. It's just far too late for us to be thinking about how do we, you know, if we're gonna design um, an education system and pathways that will help them to succeed in post-secondary education and in the economy and in careers, we need to start that much earlier. I do think we need a redesign and a reboot and we need to bring uh, our partners uh, in, in, in that are leading our workforce sector, our employers, uh, and our emergent sectors into the education system. We need a more active blending and braiding of that, right? And one of the things we're thinking about is work-based learning. What does that look like? You know, can we even start to get the vanguard of the current innovation economy to engage with our, with our high schools and with our K-12 system to provide those work-based learning opportunities now? That will retrofit and redesign that system. Great. Can we sneak in one more question? I'm told we have three minutes left. Hi. Uh, one group of people I don't think I heard you mention that, uh, this afternoon are individuals with disabilities. And we won't even go into the fact that we know um, they're underfunded um, at the federal level. And I know you all don't control how much money you have. But what I'd really like to ask is about workforce development. Um, this is. Probably, the, in fact, it is the group that experiences the highest, by far, unemployment rate. And what they need is high school, um, you know, workforce development opportunities. There are some programs in some well-funded school districts, but we really need more opportunities for those students, especially, to um, gain some work skills while they're in high school. And I wonder if the, some, any of the new funding that you all are talking about might be dedicated to something like that. I'll, I'll say yes, when we talk about diversity, equity, access, and inclusion, people with disabilities is in that group. And, and so when we talk about priority of service for resources or grant funding that we put out, for example, in the coming weeks we'll have, I've mentioned there's an $80 million funding opportunity for workforce partnerships connected to these key sectors, we call that out. I will say you can call it out, the other question is, how do you build the capacity of organizations to be prepared to take advantage of those funds and use them? That's where we have a partnership. My agency, the Employment and Training Administration, works very closely with the Office of Disability Employment Policy, or otherwise known as ODEP at the Department of Labor. We've worked with them collaboratively, on not only on designing grant opportunities, but funding technical assistance, in, in our case, to sometimes our workforce system, to our grantees, but I would say more importantly on special projects, particularly we had a, a, an entire apprenticeship initiative actually focused on individuals with disabilities. Um, 
you're, you've pointed out the right thing. It cannot be an issue of places that already have the most amount of resources that are in a position to do this. That's the gap we're trying to try to fill. And, and I will say the scope of what individuals with disability means in our workforce today is growing exponentially. And, and I, the pandemic has accelerated that. And that is not something I think as we have conversations with our partners in Congress that needs to be appreciated when it comes to resourcing things, including Office of Vocational Rehabilitation and Department of Education. All right, well, thank you all. I, we have to leave it there for time, but um, if everyone could join me in thanking the panels. Thank you.